you remember the last scene of part one? You remember Gangadhar Panth was on the stage and the audience was not ready to listen to him. Finally, after telling him and he did not listen to them to move away from the stage, they all went on the stage and they physically pushed him off the stage. And then he was nowhere to be seen. Where did he land up? What happened to him? Let's watch further. So the story goes on. That is all I have to tell Rajendra. Now, do you see what is happening? Now, this was being told to his friend Rajendra. All I know is that I was found in the Azad Maidan in the morning. Remember, after dinner, he had gone in that Azad Maidan. Morning, he found himself there. But I was back in the world I am familiar with. I am familiar, the world I know, now I was back. Now, where exactly did I spend those two days when I was absent from here? So right now, he has opened his eyes and he's telling him the last two days. Now, he was, uh, his friend is going to tell him that what had actually happened to him. He's saying, so if those two days which you're saying I was not here, where was I? What was all this I experienced? Rajendra was dumbfounded by the narrative. When he heard all this from his friend, he was shocked. It took him a while to reply. He was confused himself. He didn't know what to tell him. Professor, before, just prior to your collision with the truck, you were on your way, right? You were in a car and your collision, you banged with the truck. What were you doing? Rajendra is asking him. I was thinking of the catastrophe theory and its implications for history. So he says, listen, when you were in the car, when you were heading, okay, when you were going, your car met an accident, met with an accident, right, with the truck. At that point of time, what was going on in your mind? And that's where he says, I was thinking about the catastrophe theory and its implications for history. Catastrophe theory, what do you mean by that? Now, catastrophe theory is, you know, when there is a change in your circumstances, automatically it brings a change in your behavior, right? Now, this is what Gangadhar Panth was thinking about and its implications for history. How does it happen? So, when there is a change in your circumstance, now history, everything there was changing, you saw that, right? Now, with that change, what, how does it affect your behavior? This is what he was thinking, right? I thought so, Rajendra smiled. He said, I thought as much you were thinking something like that. Don't smile smugly, don't do that. Tell me, in case you think that it was just my mind playing tricks and my imagination running amok, look at this. And triumphantly, Professor Guy Tonde produced his vital piece of evidence, a page torn out of a book. Now, he's telling him, see, don't, don't smile like that. Don't give me that wicked smile. Tell me what exactly. If you think that my mind was playing the games, it was playing tricks with me and it was just my imagination that I was there, it was going on in my mind, then tell me one thing. He brings the, you remember he had put that in the left pocket, the Bakhar page, yeah? That vital piece of evidence, a page torn out of a book. He says, then how did this page come into my pocket? How is it possible? If I was there mentally, then how this page has come in my pocket physically? Rajendra read the text on the printed page and his face underwent a change. He was shocked the moment he read that page. Gone was the smile and in its place, came a grave expression, a very serious expression. He was visibly moved. He was more than shocked. He's saying, oh my God, how is this possible? What was it? Gangadhar Panth pressed home his advantage. Pressed home his advantage as in he lay stress. He had that peace with him. So he was emphasizing on it. He says, I had inadvertently slipped the bakar in my pocket as I left the library. Inadvertently in an unplanned manner. Remember I told you it was not very intentional. Just 
in his thoughts he was and he just put that in his pocket. So he says, I had put it in my pocket as I left the library. I discovered my error when I was paying for my meal. So when he put his hand in the pocket to take out the money, that is the time he realized, oh, I have carried this. I had intended, I had thought of returning it the next morning. Next morning, remember, he was supposed to go back to the library. But it seems that in the melee of Azad Maidan, in that huge crowd, the throng of Azad Maidan, the book was lost. The book which was there, that got lost. Only this stone of page remained. He says the book disappeared in the crowd when they hit him, they pushed him. That disappeared but one tone of page was there in his pocket. And luckily for me, the page contains vital evidence. He says, thank God, this page actually has the most important evidence. Rajendra again read the page. It described how Vishwas Rao narrowly missed the bullet and how that event taken as an omen by the Maratha army turned the tide in their favor. Now this was there in the tone page. What was it? It described how Vishwas Rao narrowly means very closely. Remember he missed the bullet just near the ear, just the distance of a thin sesame seed. And how that evident taken as an omen by the Maratha army turned the tide, reversed the trend of events. How that changed the whole trend of events in their favor. They used that accordingly and everything went in their favor. Now look at this. Gangadhar Panth produced his own copy of Bau Sai Banchi Bakhar opened at the relevant page. Relevant page as in closely connected to the subject. That same part. The account ran thus. Now what did he, what had he read? And then Vishwasrao guided his horse to the melee where the elite troops were fighting and he attacked them. And God expressed his displeasure. Remember when we read the same lines previously, those three lines, there God was merciful. He was kind to him. But here God expressed his displeasure. He was hit by the bullet. Now do you see the comparison? Right? There they are saying the Marathas won. But here, according to this, the Marathas had lost. Professor Guy Tonde, you have given me food for thought. You have given me a lot to think. Until I saw this material evidence, I had simply put your experience down to fantasy. Fantasy as in an idea with no basis in reality. He says, I just thought you were fantasizing. You were just thinking, you know, just out of nowhere. There was no reality base. But now, when I see what you have written and where I see the stone page, it is contrast, it is opposite. I need to think on the same. But facts can be stranger than fantasies as I am beginning to realize. He says the facts can be stranger. It's strange. It is stranger than fantasies. Fantasies, you can fantasize anything. You can imagine, you can think anything. But here the facts were stating different. Facts. What are the facts? I am dying to know. Professor Guy Tonde said, he says, look, I want to know what the facts are. Please unveil it. Please speak it out. Rajendra motioned him to silence and started pacing the room. He was walking up and down, obviously under great mental strain. He had a lot of pressure. Finally, he turned around and said, Professor Guy Tonde, I will try to rationalize attempt to explain or justify with logical reasoning your experience on the basis of two scientific theories as known today. What were those two scientific theories? Whether I succeed or not in convincing you of the facts, only you can judge. For you have indeed passed through a fantastic experience. Or more correctly, a catastrophic experience. He says, see, I will try my level best to explain to you exactly what has happened. All right. Based on two theories, two scientific theories, because 
and you will be able to judge whether I have done it correctly or not because you have gone through that experience, that fantastic experience. Yeah, so you will be the best judge to tell me that. He says maybe a catastrophic, not even a fantastic one, but a catastrophic as in involving a sudden and large scale alteration. So you have gone through it, right? Please continue Rajendra, I am all ears. I want to listen, I'm listening with full interest. Professor Guy Tonde replied, Rajendra continued pacing as he talked. He was up and down, up and down while he was talking, yeah? You have heard a lot about the catastrophe theory at that seminar. Seminar as in the conference or the meeting for discussion or training. Let us apply it to the battle of Panipat. He says, now listen, you have attended that catastrophe theory seminar. You had attended uh, that time it was going on. What was catastrophe theory again? Let me remind you. Yes, change in the circumstances bring a change in the behavior. So now let us apply to the battle of Panipat. Wars fought face to face on open grounds offer excellent examples of this theory. He's saying when wars are fought face to face, you know, on open grounds, they offer an excellent example to this theory. The Maratha army was facing Abdali's troops on the field of Panipat. Now you remember Abdali who was driven away to Kabul? Yeah, so they were facing that the Maratha army and Abdali's troops were having this war. There was no great disparity between the latter's troops. Disparity as in a large difference. Latter means Abdali, the second person. And the opposing forces, that's the Marathas. Their armor was comparable. Their bravery, their courage, it was comparable. So a lot depended on the leadership and the morale of the troops. Now, if they had to get victory, it all depended on what? On the leadership, how your leader guides you, right? And the morale of the troops. The juncture at which Vishwas Rao, the son of and heir to the Peshwa, was killed proved to be the turning point. The juncture as in a particular point at that point of time when he was killed, right? Who was he? Come on, the son of and heir to the Peshwa. Now, when he was killed, that was the turning point. That was the twist. As history has it, his uncle, Bau Sahib, rushed into the melee and was never seen again. His uncle also, Bau Sahib, went into that, but he was never seen again. Whether he was killed in battle or survived is not known. That's a mystery. Nobody knows that. But for the troops at that particular moment, that blow of losing their leaders was crucial. Now, obviously, when the army is fighting, they are seeing that the leader is there. But when they realize that their leader has been killed, they are in a fix. Obviously, they lost their morale. They lost that courage, that, you know, willingness to fight and the fighting spirit. There followed an utter route. This is where the whole change came and they had to go back. There followed an utter route. Exactly, Professor. And what you have shown me on that tone page is the course taken by the battle when the bullet missed Vishwas Rao. Now here, the tone page is saying that Vishwas Rao missed the bullet. Right? And according to the actual history, he was killed. A crucial event gone the other way. It turned the whole thing. And its effect on the troops was also the opposite. Obviously, the circumstance was what? He missed the bullet. So the troops were okay. They continued fighting. There was no issue. It boosted their morale. They were happy and provided just that extra. They were like, wow, he's saved. Come on, keep fighting. That extra impetus that made all the difference, Rajendra said. Impetus as in that motivation, that extra, it boosted them. It gave them way more confidence and they, that made all the difference, Rajendra said. He says this is where they actually could do it because their leaders survived. Maybe so. Similar statements are made about the Battle of Waterloo, which Napoleon could have won. 
But we live in a unique world which has a unique history. This idea of it might have been is okay for the sake of speculation as in forming of theory without evidence. You might say it might have been this. You are forming some theory. You don't have the evidence of the same. You don't have proof of the same. So for the sake of, uh, sake of speculation, but not for reality. Gangadhar Pant said, he says, see, this all is okay. When we say it, when we don't have evidence, that is the time, but for in, when it comes to reality, it's not even possible. I take issue with you there. I take issue with you there as in I object. I don't agree with what you say. In fact, that brings me to my second point, which you may find strange, but please hear me out. Rajendra said, he said, look, I don't agree to what you're saying. In fact, I'm coming to my second point. And in that case, you might find it strange. But for God's sake, first listen to me. Gangadhar Pant listened expectantly as Rajendra continued. He quietly listened. He was watching, I mean, you know, watching and listening. What do we mean by reality? Rajendra is asking him. He says, tell me, what do you mean by reality? We experience it directly with our senses or indirectly via instruments. Now that's reality. But is it limited to what we see? Does it have other manifestations? Manifestations as in an appearance of something. So is it only what we see or there is something more to it also? That reality may not be unique has been found from experiments on very small systems of atoms and their constituent particles. Constituent as in being a part of something, some particles of it. When dealing with such systems, the physicist discovered something startling, something shocking. What? The behavior of these systems cannot be predicted definitively even if all the physical laws governing those systems are known. So he says, see these atoms that we are talking about, these systems he talks about here, you cannot predict them. You cannot say that they will move in this direction only. Not sure. That's what the physicist has said. They can move in any direction. Even if all the physical laws governing those systems are known, even if you know all the rules, all the laws, yet you are not sure, you cannot guarantee that they will move in the same system, in the same manner or in the same direction. Take an example. I fire and now this will make things very clear for you. Please understand this. Listen attentively. I fire an electron from a source. Where will it go? If I fire a bullet from a gun in a given direction at a given speed, I know where it will be at a later time. He says, if I shoot, I know I'm shooting in this direction. I know the bullet will go from here. It will go there only. Obviously, if I, my gun is like this. The bullet cannot come here, right? It will go in this direction only. And I know where exactly it will go. That is understood. But I cannot make such an assertion for the electron. He's talking of the electrons in the brain. Okay. It may be here, there anywhere. This we know will go straight. But when it comes to an electron, we do not know. It can go here, it can go there, it can go anywhere. I can at best quote odds for it being found in a specified location at a specified time. He's saying I can best quote odds. It can be in any odd position. For it being found, it can be found in a specified location at a specified time. No. The lack of determinism, determinism as in doctrine that all events, including human action, are ultimately determined by causes regarded as external to the will. Now, according to your will, it may not go as per that line. It may just be different. So, the lack of determinism in quantum theory, determinism as in doctrine that all events, including human action, are ultimately determined by causes regarded as external to the will. Now, whether you want to do it, you're determined to do it or not, yes. But what is that in quantum theory? Quantum theory is what? It is that fundamental theory in physics. 
right which gives you the physical properties it gives the description of the physical properties of nature at the level of atoms and subatomic particles now he says even an ignoramus historian like me has heard of it ignoramus as in ignorant or stupid he's saying a person like me a historian like me also has heard of it professor gaitonde said he says even i have heard of it so what are you trying to tell me so imagine many world pictures he says okay he goes further to explain rajendra goes ahead in one world the electron is found here in another it is over there he says like now you were in two worlds your electron in one place it was elsewhere in the other place it was somewhere else in yet another it is still in a different location once the observer finds where it is we know which world we are talking about now based on the position of that electron it all depends according to the position of that electron do we know that in which world are you okay but all those alternative worlds could exist just the same you have not gone to the past or the future present only it is just the same that world exists now somewhere else it is going on there also so based on where your electron finds the position you land up in that world and at the same moment the same time it is not you are, you have not gone away in the past or the future so but all those alternative worlds could exist just the same rajendra paused to marshal his thoughts as in to reorganize his thoughts he says exactly that's how it is but is there any contact between those many worlds professor gaitonde asked he says so are these worlds connected by any chance do they have any contact yes and no imagine two worlds for example in both an electron is orbiting in the nucleus of an atom orbiting as in moving in orbit okay revolving around and the nucleus of an atom and as he goes on like planets around the sun gangadhar panth in, uh, interjected he says he said it abruptly you know especially as an interruption so are you trying to tell me just like the planets around the sun is that how that electron is orbiting the nucleus of an atom is that how it is not quite we know the precise trajectory of the planet trajectory as in the path followed by a projectile you know you know that path when we draw you know you have a particular path we know that it will go in that particular path the electron could be orbiting in any of a large number of specified states he saying that electron does not have a specified path it can just go anywhere these states may be used to identify the world now depending on which in which state that electron is there you will find that particular world in state number 1 we have the electron in a state of higher energy in state number 2 it is in a state of lower energy it can make a jump from high to low energy and send out a pulse of radiation or a pulse of radiation can knock it out of state number 2 into state number 1 now he says it's not confusing just understand it he says that electron can be in any now if it's in the higher energy level okay there is one in the lower energy level now this electron can move from high to low or vice versa from low to high it can be anything it's not a fixed path such transitions are common in microscopic systems what if it happened on a macroscopic level rajendra said he said they are common in microscopic systems but macroscopic as in which is visible to the naked eye not microscopic that's macroscopic so what do you think what if it happened on a macroscopic level rajendra said i get you you are suggesting that i made a transition from one world to another and back again ganga gangadhar pant asked he says so is that what you are trying to tell me that i made a transition now just like from the high energy to the low energy or the low energy to the high energy likewise gangadhar panth made a transition from one world to another and back 
Fantastic though it seems, this is the only explanation I can offer. My theory is that catastrophic situations offer radically different alternatives for the world to proceed. Radically as in thoroughly, completely different alternatives for the world to proceed. It seems that so far as reality is concerned, all the alternatives are viable. But the observer can experience only one of them at a time. He's saying all of them exist. All of them are there. But your, the observer can experience only one at a time. You can, though there are many situations, but you will experience only one at a time. By making a transition, you were able to experience two worlds, although one at a time. The one you live in now and the one where you spent two days. One has the history we know, the other a different history. In one the Marathas one, in one the Mughals one. There he's still talking of the British where the East India Company was there, everything. Here it was all over and out. The separation or bifurcation, bifurcation as a division of something into two branches or parts took place in the battle of Panipat. You neither traveled to the past nor to the future, just like I told you. He was, a, he was in two different worlds at the same time. Present moment, right? You were in the present, but experiencing a different world. Of course, by the same token, there must be many more different worlds arising out of bifurcations at different points of time. He's saying only these two worlds don't exist. There may be many more. But like he said, that observer can experience only one world at a time. As Rajendra concluded, Gangadhar Panth asked the question that was beginning to bother him most. But why did I make the transition? He says, okay, it happened to me. But can you kindly explain to me why did it happen? Why did I make the transition? If I knew the answer, I would solve a great problem. Unfortunately, there are many unsolved questions in science and this is one of them. But that does not stop me from guessing. Rajendra smiled and proceeded. He says, see, there are certain questions in science which we don't know. We have no answers to it. But still, that does not stop me. You need some interaction to cause a transition. There has to be some interaction. Perhaps at the time of the collision, you were thinking about the catastrophe theory and its role in wars. When the accident happened, when you crashed, you know, when your car hit the truck, at that point of time, you were thinking in your mind, it was the catastrophe theory and its role in wars. Maybe you were wondering about the battle of Panipat. You were also thinking about that. Perhaps the neurons in your brain acted as a trigger. At that point of time, the neurons acted as a trigger and the transition happened. A good guess. I was indeed wondering what course history would have taken if the result of the battle had gone the other way. Professor Gaitonde said, he says, I was just wondering. So what would have been the current scenario if history had, it, the result of the battle of Panipat had gone the other way, what would have been the scene of India? That was going to be the topic of my thousandth pre presidential address. He's saying this is what is going to be the topic of my thousandth. So he addresses, right? Presidential address. Now, you are in the happy position of recounting your real life experience rather than speculating. Rajendra laughed. He says, okay, now you're back to reality, back to position, back to your real life experience rather than, you know, just speculating, just thinking of those things and imagining. But Gangadhar Pant was grave. He was serious. Rajendra started laughing that, okay, everything's back to normal, but he was serious. No, Rajendra, my thousandth address was made on the Azad Maidan where I was rudely interrupted. He says, no, that was my thousandth address and that was badly interrupted. No, the Professor Gaitonde who disappeared while defending his chair on the platform will now never be seen presiding at another meeting. 
I have conveyed my regrets to the organizers of the Panipat seminar. He says that professor, that Professor Gaitonde, who disappeared while saving his chair, you know, on the stage, he was trying to protect himself and save his chair on the platform. Now he will never be seen. He will never be, you know, presiding at any other meeting. And for the same, I have conveyed my regrets to the organizers of the Panipat seminar. He says, I have given it to them. I have offered my regrets that I'm sorry. It won't be possible again. And that is where he is back to his real world complicated isn't it but fun equally adventurous where he was how the electrons moved when he collided and where two days of coma because of that accident in those two days he went to another world he saw the whole different history how he brings a page back in his pocket how this whole thing happened was so beautifully explained by Rajendra, his friend, and tells him exactly what had happened. So yeah, it was a very complicated but a very interesting story. And to conclude this wonderful story, you never know how much you really believe anything until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death to you. C.S. Lewis has very beautifully said, he says, you never know how much you really believe anything. You won't believe. You don't know how much to believe until and unless that becomes a question of life and death to you. Only then do you start believing anything. So yes, believe it right now that we have come to the end of the chapter. Yes, it's not a question of life and death, of course. But yes, it's a good conclusion to the wonderful story for such more interesting stories. Keep watching and keep learning.